Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. I hope that uh, you enjoy the coffee break session that we had just now. And moving on, of course, now that the conference is officially open, we will move on to our next event. And that is the soft launch of the double master degree program between the Faculty of Administrative Science with Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis, University of Canberra, Australia. So before that, I would like to show some video, a video profile of Universitas Indonesia and from University of Canberra. First, I would like to present the video profile from Universitas Indonesia. So please enjoy. change for more than a century. <laughs> Founded as Japanese medical doctor school, today Universitas Indonesia became a center of science, technology, culture, and arts. Located in 320 hectares greenery, Universitas Indonesia offers a comfortable environment for daily teaching and research activities. Each year, some 6,000 undergraduate and graduate students join Universitas Indonesia. To become a good best world-class research university, Universitas Indonesia is committed to providing wide and fair access of high-quality teaching and learning. In the process to be an open knowledge community, Universitas Indonesia is committed to provide learning opportunities to talented students from all over the world through its extensive scholarship program for more than 500 students each year. <laughs> Many of the students from Universitas Indonesia play a central role in both national and global development. A strong tradition in making a contribution to society. Being part of global education institutions. 
Indonesia. Universitas Indonesia invites <coughs> students from all over the world a value of learning how to convey and to accept knowledge in global society despite different language and cultural backgrounds. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That's the video profile of Universitas Indonesia. So, hold on, we still have another video, and this is the video profile from the Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis, University of Canberra, Australia. So, ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy.
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And with the video profile of Universitas Indonesia and Universitas Canberra, uh, we hope that you will give more deep insight about Universitas Indonesia and, of course, uh, the Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis, University of Canberra. Ladies and gentlemen, moving on, we are one step closer to the official soft launch of the double master degree program. Before that, please let me show you just one more video, one more video, uh, a video presentation about this soft launch. So, ladies and gentlemen, the joint master degree program in public administration is organized by the Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis at the University of Canberra and the Faculty of Administrative Science, Universitas Indonesia. The program is launched on 30 October 2018 and allows students to undertake their first and fourth semester of master's program in Universitas Indonesia, while for the second and third semester will be taken in University of Canberra. For further details on admission requirements, you can find it on the brochure that's attached in your conference kit as well as the detailed courses that will be taken in Universitas Indonesia and University of Canberra. And for the information, this program is the second double degree program for Faculty of Administrative Science and as for the opening registration will be open around February until April 2019. For further information, you can definitely see the official website on the brochure that's attached and you can also reach us, reach us through our official emails as well. So ladies and gentlemen, that's it for the video presentation. Moving on to our official soft launch, we will have the next event, the signing of the canvas as a symbolic procession. We would like to invite Professor Eko Prasojo from Universitas Indonesia and Professor Mark Evans from University of Canberra to the stage. Yes, so Professor Eko and Professor Mark Evans will uh, have to sign the canvas as a symbolic procession of this soft launch for the double master degree program. Thank you very much. And we will have also another, this is the first time that we uh, have this soft launch and site on a big canvas like this. So yeah, it's really interesting. Thank you very much, Professor Edwin, Professor Edwin. We would like to have a photo together. Would that be okay? Thank you very much, Professor Eko and Professor Mark. Now I would like to uh, ask Professor Mark to please uh, welcome yes to the seat. Uh, excuse me, I mean welcome uh, to the seat for Professor Eko's uh, speech. Professor Mark, sure. Um, it's, a, it's a collaboration that we are very proud of because we are very proud to be associated uh, with the University of, of Indonesia. Um, the double master's degree, as you'll see tomorrow, is, is a key component of our new collaborative center in transformational leadership. Um, and we think that the double master's degree 
degree has some very unique features. Um, the first is that it's um, generally co-designed between um, colleagues in, uh, in, in the, um, the Faculty of Administrative Sciences here at uh, UI and Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis. Um, but it's underpinned by leading research, leading governance research in terms of what works. Um, but it also has a very strong applied focus. It's very much geared to supporting national development priorities in Indonesia. And I think that is what is unique about it. Because traditionally, Indonesian students have been sent overseas and have largely studied the governance of other countries. Whereas this focuses very strongly on supporting Indonesian administrative development um, efforts. Um, we also, as you'll see through our centre, attempt to bring together the best of theory and the best of practice in a creative union. And again, we think that that is very unique. Most master's degrees in public administration are still very traditionally academic. This is about bringing research and practice together in a dynamic way. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, particularly um, um, Pat Echo, uh, Prasolzor, uh, for making this happen, um, and for your colleagues being such um, amazing collaborators. Uh, it has been one of the great joys of my career to collaborate with you and your, and your colleagues. And we, I also think that over the next five to ten years, we're going to make a very significant contribution to governance practices here in, in Indonesia that will improve the quality of the lives of everyday Indonesian citizens. <laughs> So many thanks to you for your time. Yeah, thank you very much, Pak Mark. I think Pak Mark is one of the prominent in public administrations, as we saw in this uh, video, and uh, also Pak Kerry Stokers. So we started to uh, collaborate with the uh, Institute for Governance of Policy Analysis, I think uh, since uh, 2015, uh, with Pak. Salomo also and uh, uh, Julian Sack. So it is a long, uh, long time to uh, build uh, collaborations between uh, faculty of administrative science at the University of Indonesia and also IFA, University of Canberra. What uh, we are going to achieve with these uh, collaborations that we are going to uh, merge between the theory and also practice in public administration said by Professor Marx. So we also talked to the uh, ministries and also agencies in Indonesia that uh, civil servants uh, are working in these ministries to apply this uh, master in public administrations. So this is very unique because uh, our, our goal is to help the government of Indonesia to strengthen the capacity and also the culture of uh, civil servants to be uh, uh, to have a better culture in the bureaucracy. So this is a part of uh, our contribution to accelerate the administrative reform in Indonesia. Uh, and I hope uh, this could, as uh, Mark said, to also create a better bureaucracy and public administration for the next uh, period of Indonesia. We know that public administration is an active factor and also a necessary condition for politics. So we got uh, accountable, responsive, transparent, and also professional public administration. We could not achieve uh, important goals uh, in Indonesia. And as well as we also collaborate with the University of Gajah Mada, with the Sikobo PMs. Tomorrow we are going to uh, uh, launch so-called um, uh, Center for uh, Excellent Leadership uh, what is, uh, transform the uh, leadership in Indonesia. So we invite also some ministries and I hope that Pak uh, will also come tomorrow to give us uh, a short uh, presentation.
implementation of social speech regarding this uh, center for excellent initiatives. And this is part of uh, this center of excellent initiatives. So master in public administration, and we are going also to complete uh, a double degree in a doctoral degree as well as expert in in some subjects like uh, performance management, business space policy, uh, change management. So with this of launching, I hope that uh, we could uh, strengthen the collaborations between Indonesia, Indonesia and Australia in general, uh, specifically between the University of Indonesia and the University of Canberra. Thank you very much, Omar, again. There is an exchange of souvenirs, a little gift from UI Universitas Indonesia, the University of Canberra, as well as from University of Canberra to Universitas Indonesia. Thank you very much, sir. And we, after this, we would like to have a group photo, photo every time, every minute, uh, a group photo, yes. I would like to invite our dear keynote speakers, our board of director and lecturer of uh, Faculty of Administrative Science, Universitas Indonesia, our VIP guests to please come to the front of the stage to take a photo together again.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen. And now that the group photo has finally ended, and we have already watched the signing, the symbolic signing on the canvas. The soft launch of the double master, master degree program has finally been done. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, with this soft launch, we hope that this will strengthen the bond between specifically Universitas Indonesia and University of Canberra uh, to in, the, in the acceleration of the administrative reform. So, ladies and gentlemen, moving on to our next agenda for today. Next, we will have the plenary session of this conference, our first plenary session. I would like to introduce our keynote speakers for today. We will have Professor Mark Evans, Professor Wayudi Kumurotomo, and Dr. Lizan Perante Kalina. They will be moderated by our Dean of Faculty of Administrative Science, Universitas Indonesia, Professor Eko Prasojo, who is also the President of Indonesian Association for Public Administration. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome Professor Eko Prasojo. and seminar I will be a speaker but this is a assignment from the uh, head of chairman of the committee and I have to uh, follow the, his order so I would like to uh, invite professor Mark Evans uh, from University of Canberra please Mark and professor, uh, Mark. professor Wajudiku Morotomo from the University of Canberra and also Dr. Lizan Piranza to come to the stage. specifically. So he's a director of uh, Institute for Governance and say, uh, Analysis at the University of Canberra. So Pak Mark will talk about policy innovation and governance reform that matter in digital era. I think Pak Mark has uh, conducted more research on uh, digitalization and digital governance. So he's also right now conducting uh, mistrust, uh, research on mistrust in, in governments, in the uh, federal government of Australia. Uh, pa, professor Wahyudin Kumarotomo is a professor at the University of Mada. I think uh, he's conduct, uh, conduct, uh, he has conducted more research on uh, public finance, specifically on the uh, local government's finance. So, Professor Wahyudi will talk about public policy and governance under digital ecosystem. Some practical experience from Indonesia. So, actually, we, um, we should have Professor Alex Pilante from the Philippines. So, unfortunately, uh, his flight uh, has been cancelled yesterday night. 
So Dr. Lizan Pirante will represent him and also replace him to talk about uh, local government readiness in digital era, a melting point between uh, local capability and global challenge. So Dr. Lizan Pirante is a lecturer at the University of Filipina at the National College of Public Administration and Governance. She's also, she's also working at the Parliament of uh, Philippines. So I think uh, without further ado, I would like to invite pa Marx uh, to be the first uh, speakers talking about the policy innovation and governance reform that matter in digital era. So I give time for you, Mark. So, uh, what is the best for you? You, you can uh, stand up. Um, in liberal democracies, 
most governments are not just characterized by bureaucratic risk aversion, but also by political risk, risk aversion. So politicians are often as risk averse as public organizations. And that's because they're worried about undermining their coalition of support. So they're less likely to take risks in terms of trying to solve some of the big public policy problems that they're confronting. So in Australia, we see this in relation to climate change. Maybe in Jakarta, we see this in relation to transport policy. Okay? Um, the fact that um, many Jakartans still spend five hours a day traveling to and back from work in many countries would be viewed not to be acceptable, right? Because obviously it undermines the quality of life really very significantly. Um, so, but the argument is that maybe that is a wicked problem that is just too difficult to solve. Um, the same in Australia, we have a government that at the moment denies that there is such a thing as climate change. Um, but we're just about to go into another, another major drought in Australia. So everybody knows that there is clearly a problem with the climate, but we have a political class that denies the existence of the problem. Then we have the problem of what is called bureaucratic coordination, and that is the nature of the business of government means that its culture is based upon process-driven public administration rather than outcomes-driven public administration. So um, within that context, public organizations are less likely to engage in innovation. And there's also the argument, basically, from organizational sociology that public organizations don't tend to engage with other sectors, with the community sector or the private sector. They tend to cut themselves off from exchange. And as we know, the key source of innovation is the ability to interact with other knowledge sectors, to share ideas, and to collaborate on innovative projects. Now, my argument basically in, in this um, address is that those key hypotheses that dominate academic understanding of the barriers to innovation are currently being questioned. Secondly, when we look at how innovation is defined, we can see that there's a spectrum in terms of how people understand innovation. There are those, such as Mark Bovins, who argues that you can only really have genuine innovation as a consequence of some form of disruption. So as a consequence of global financial crisis, or regime change, or, as I will argue today, digital change. In my view, digital technology is creating a disruptive space for doing public administration differently. So we see this spectrum from disruption to the other end of the continuum, where, um, Academics like um, Borens, Stanford Borens, basically argues that innovation is a product of incrementalism. Marginal adjustments to the status quo over time leading to radical change. Um, so most academic thinkers tend to either emphasize the importance of disruption or they emphasize the importance of incrementalism. Third, at the moment we're seeing a convergence, in my view, between academic and practice-based understanding of innovation around the importance of co-design and what some writers, such as Jerry Stoker, calls public value creation, or what you might understand as citizen-centered government citizen-centered governance. So the argument here um, is that in a similar way to new public management, 
Um, we are witnessing a social movement, almost like a, a global social movement, focusing on human-centered design. So this is just a list of the range of international organizations that have emerged over the past decade devoted to using human-centered design in policy development and service delivery. So it's design thinking, design thinking, that is starting to change the DNA of many public services around the world, but particularly Westminster-style bureaucracies. So for example, in the Australian Public Service at the moment, we have 22 design agencies, right? Uh, practicing human-centered design. Um, and by human-centered design, um, I'm talking about the use of what are sometimes called agile techniques. And they tend to focus on bringing groups of stakeholders or citizens together to solve particular problems that they're confronting within the service system. And they basically go through three processes. They go through a, a process of discovery in which they scope the nature of the problem and they identify their needs and aspirations for the future. They prototype new products and services. Right? And then they experiment, right? usually small scale. And then if, the, if those experiments are successful, they scale up. We call this try, test, and learn. So that approach to public administration is challenging significantly established ways of doing things. So this is my first um, key argument. So what is driving innovation? Now here I'm going to draw on some a survey um, of elite thinkers in digital innovation in Australia um, that I conducted a year ago, together with a national survey of Australians on how they understand and imagine their democracy. Um, and another survey that we conducted on what Australian citizens expect from digital public services. Okay, the, the first slide basically identifies what most departmental secretaries and chief information officers view to be the key drivers of change. So the first one has been that up until um, his, well, as you know, we have a new prime minister in Australia again. Um, but the former prime minister, Malcolm Turnbull, was a great champion of digital change. And he insisted that all departments and agencies in Commonwealth government had digital first targets. And all departments and agencies, particularly with large-scale interactions with the citizenry, like the Australian Tax Office, the Department of Human Services, and the Department of Industry and Innovation and Science providing grants to small and medium-sized businesses, had targets of 80% digital coverage in their services by 2017. And all of those departments have reached that target. Okay. Why? Because the Prime Minister insisted that they met that target. And also resources were made available through the Modernization Fund for those particular departments to actually make the change. Okay. So we have had a strong political driver for reform. At the same time as in Indonesia, most Australian citizens have moved decisively towards embracing new technologies. Um, so 85% of Australians transact um, with government and with the private sector online. They make online transactions. User coverage, those people with smartphones and iPads or tablets, now have a reach of about 70% of the population. Okay. 
So basically, um, society has moved. Government has been much slower to move. Right? So government is playing catch up with society. Now, of course, as in Indonesia, we also have lots of citizens who haven't embraced technology, or because they um, have low incomes, are not able to afford this form of technology. Um, and of course, very specific programs have been developed to support those groups, uh, particularly um, marginalized indigenous Australians. Of course, the third driver is advanced this advances in digital technologies that's actually making doing digital public services more possible than in the past. We also have macroeconomic conditions in which there's a big focus on doing more with less. So cost containment is driving innovation as well. So of course, this is a big critique of public choice theory. Because the argument here is, well, actually, cost containment is driving competition, right? Politics is driving competition. So one of the key uh, propositions of public choice theory is being challenged very significantly. And this is part, of course, of a move towards smaller government. But one of the key drivers at the moment in Australia is the growing trust deficit. We have had a decade of democratic decline in Australia. Since 2007, when 86% of Australians trusted their politicians and had faith in their democratic arrangements, we see today that has declined to 41%. So we've had a very significant period of um, democratic dissatisfaction. This has largely been exacerbated by the various leadership crises that we've had in Commonwealth government. Um, and it's surprising because Australia has had 25 years of economic growth. So most people would say that if, if you want to know um, the outcome of a federal election, they would say, is the economy stupid? So as long as the economy is doing well, the government will stay in power. Not in Australia. Governing competence is now as important as economic success. So we've seen a big shift there. Levels of trust in government and politicians are at their lowest levels since we've been carrying out um, surveys. Australians trust governments to address national security issues, but very little else. The majority of Australians have very low faith in the ability of politicians to solve big public policy problems. When we ask them, well, what reforms would you like to see? They want the ability to hold politicians to account locally. They want to see the reform of political parties. They want to see increased participation of ordinary people in public affairs. And they want to make the Australian Parliament more representative of the people it serves. They also want greater digital engagement. When we ask them, well, what would you like to see change in terms of digital public service production? We see that there's a growing willingness amongst the Australian citizenry to use online services and a preference for online services over other delivery channels. We see that the public sector is still perceived to be behind the private sector in this regard, but actually citizens just want to see more digital public services. They don't really care whether it's delivered by the public or the private sector. Um, again, confidence in government to deliver effective public policy outcomes is very low. But Australians expect government to innovate. This is a really important point. They expect to have the same relationship with their government that they have with their smartphone providers or their iPad service providers. Okay? That sense of immediacy and convenience. 
of course, this, great, this creates great overwhelming expectation for government. And probably governments will not be able to reach and realize those expectations because, as we know, technology is changing all the time. So how is the Commonwealth government responding? Um, well, in our research, um, we argue, basically, that uh, the public service has a key role to play in terms of reconnecting with the citizenry, or what we call seeing like a citizen. The public service has to be a key instrument for trust building. And they can do that in a number of ways. They can introduce new digital methods of governing that enable participation and improve the quality of services through digital enablers. They can empower citizens through the co-design of projects and services. They can engage citizens in policy development and operational delivery through digital enablers. This is the area of digital democracy, but actually it's the area that is least developed. Digital democracy is still very much in its infancy around the world. But that, that is a huge space for potential um, experimentation. In sum, we need to mainstream a culture of seeing like a citizen in which public services become key instruments of trust building. Why? Because most, public, most citizens never see politicians, but they engage with public services all the time. So this slide gives you an overview of how the Commonwealth Government is responding um, in Australia. And what we can see is that we've seen um, a proliferation of online digital platforms for delivering public services, particularly in those ministries with um, high quotas of citizen interaction. The Department of Human Services, the Tax Office, the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science. We also see um, the greater use of um, drone technology um, in environmental policy and in transport policy. And we're seeing the greater use of artificial intelligence as well. So I just want to pick out some key examples. This, of course, is familiar now around the world. So Indonesia now, as well, has obviously um, reached what I call digital era governments. One, e-immigration smart gates are now commonplace around the world. So that's a feature of what we call digital era governments. One. Um, we're also seeing the way in which um, military drone technology is being translated in a meaningful way for public policy, and it plays a key role in Australia in terms of monitoring our transport systems and changes in our environmental systems as well. So for drought affected and flood affected countries, such for flood affected countries such as Indonesia, um, drone technology becomes very important in terms of providing real time big data on what's happening within the environment and provides the ability, for example, for disaster agencies to move much more quickly than in the past. We're also seeing the proliferation of the use of robot technology. Um, so for example, in New Zealand, just across the ditch from Australia, New Zealand has now become the largest user of robot care workers per capita in the world. So increasingly we're, you, we're seeing the use of robot care workers uh, in our communities. I just want to give you one important <coughs> example in Australia because for me this is a barometer of change, a key barometer of change. This is Nadia. Nadia is an artificially intelligent public servant that works for the National Disability Insurance Agency. She was designed by Mark Sager, Dr. Mark Sager, from the University of Auckland, who won an Oscar for Avatar and Spider-Man 2 and King Kong. Right? 
And he worked with a group of Australians who are suffering from different forms of disability to create an artificially, artificially intelligent, but emotionally intelligent robot public servant. And Nadia was piloted recently, and on average, citizens spent an hour and 15 minutes with Nadia. They loved Nadia because she was empathetic. She gave them consistent advice about their services, right? And she didn't judge them. The pilots were phenomenal and were going to be rolled out across Australia. And we were going to see, actually, the closure of many call centres for public services. And it was heralded as a key way of cutting public expenditure. But two months ago, it was frozen. Why? Because a lot of those call centres are in marginal constituencies, and we have an election coming up. And it won't be popular in those electorates. So what does that tell us? It tells us that politics still plays a key role in slowing down the pace of change. It also tells us, of course, that different societies will make different social choices about how much they want to embrace this agenda or not. But what it also tells us is that some of the big moral and ethical questions about robotics are very much alive in our public services today. So Nadia really is a, is a barometer of digital change um, in Australia. So what are the key barriers to digital change that have been experienced and how can they be mitigated? Well, none of these barriers are surprising to scholars of public administration. We see um, a major problem in terms of the resistance of IT tribes to radical digital change. We see the way in which most uh, public bureaucracies are led by public servants that don't have digital capability or imagination. So digital change is not necessarily well understood in many public organizations. We see the way in which politicians embrace certain forms of digital change, but resist others for political reasons. We see the way in which resources are fundamental in order for public organizations to make the great leap forward in terms of embracing digital change. Initiations in the vulnerability, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Uh, society and maybe uh, global dynamic society. So she mentioned also about why smart governance. So the government that characterized by uh, learning and adapt, uh, adapt capability of adaptations, competent and effective. Uh, and also she mentioned about the uh, some import of local governments in Philippines. The, uh, Naga City, Cebu City, and Kagaya to Oro uh, to innovate uh, public services. But uh, we face also the gap of capacity and asymmetrical development in the local, national, and also uh, global governments. I think uh, this is all uh, presentation from the speakers. Now it's the time to uh, discussions. So we have maybe uh, 30 minutes before lunch. So I would offer the participant to ask to give uh, input, and, uh, input and feedback for the speakers, please. Pauli, do you want to ask something? Please, Pat. Starting from the lecture, yeah, please. Me. Hello. Barry, are you, are you going to ask?
present them for very excellent presentation, also uh, giving us a new ideas, new thought about all of them discuss about the differentiation and also innovation. And this is uh, I would like uh, I would like uh, to ask to Prof. Mark Evans that in uh, his uh, early presentation he said that public servant most likely doesn't like to innovate, doesn't like uh, they like to cut themselves from others. Uh, how do you think that uh, what's going to be happen while well, now? Innovation or changing is uh, something that we cannot avoid. It's inevitable. And I do also agree with you uh, that a lot of civil service now is like a digital immigrant, while now people is like as a native or uh, digital. Uh, they're gonna to some point will I think will be collides. How that uh, public service uh, can survive? Because I do agree with you, Pa, that we cannot solve tomorrow problem with yesterday knowledge, yeah, Pa. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paroli. The next, uh... okay, Pa. Thank you for, the, for this chance. Um, my question is, I would like to address to the last two presenters. <clears throat> it's very really in located uh, problems. Uh, actually, I agree with uh, the concluding remarks that you have uh, decided, but uh, there is a problems in Indonesia, especially in Indonesia. Um, I'm from Makassar City, uh, Hasanuddin University. Um, the problem is uh, we have, I would like to suggest about the whole of government paradigm. Because in uh, developing countries, we have problem about the public service, collaboration, the tools, and others. The capacity of people that say uh, human development is very lower. We have agree about that, maybe. So, when we when the government make uh, some policies about how to blow up the maybe the economic or the development program, they have found about the problem for the people, how to change the people mind in making the policies or implementation, public policy implementation. That's the problem. That's the root of the problems in Indonesia. So I would like to suggest about the whole of government pull up government paradigm that we have to uh, apply in, let's say, in university or in bureaucracy. The second is, we had problem about the public trust. In my dissertation about trust, the theory of trust, I take the theory of collision and convention. There are five problems. There are five problems in how to build up the trust of people or citizen trust. The first is agreement trust. The second is the benefit of doubts. The third, reliability. And the fourth, the opportunistic of opportunistic behavior. Opportunistic behavior. The absence of opportunistic behavior. And the fourth, the fifth is good build trust. We have problem about how to to minimize to minimize the uh, let's say the opportunistic behavior. 
we have maybe we have to make more research about how to minimize the opportunistic behavior of bureaucracy. Okay? So I, I would like to suggest that uh, all of us here, uh, we try to, to blow or to explore why Indonesia public service is still lower. What is the matter? We just talk about the, uh, the, the above problems, but we cannot uh, explore what is the root, the root of problems in Indonesia. Why? Let's say maybe grab maybe that is the problems. How it will make it crowded in Indonesia transportation. This only make maybe some let's say maybe the benefits of people, other people. And I would like to suggest that one paradigm paradigm is that full of government. ICT problems culture set problems or mindset how about that how we can divide it in our bureaucracy or in university thank you one more question please yeah one more question Nanti boleh. diterjemahkan oleh Pak Kumolo. Uh, berkenan untuk kemudian di Oke. Okay. Uh, Prof. Mark Evans tadi menyatakan ada empat uh, barriers dari uh, pengembangan inovasi. Nah, menurut saya hal ini juga terjadi di Indonesia. Cultural barrier, legislative barrier, political barrier, dan resource. Bagaimana cara untuk uh, aplikasinya di Indonesia? Solusi apa? Karena di Indonesia juga sedang mengembangkan hal ini sudah ada aturan tentang uh, sistem elektronik, gitu kan sudah keluar PP terbaru tentang elektronik. Nah, seperti apa barriernya? Tentu aja ini uh, menarik untuk didiskusikan. Terima kasih. Now I have an assign more assignment to translate the question. Thank you, Michael. But anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, the participant uh, would like to raise the questions on the problem of the four barriers for innovation, something that uh, has been mentioned by uh, Professor uh, Mark Evans and also Dr. Uh, and uh, what she was asking uh, is actually something that is related to the fact that uh, government has uh, actually always been too late to respond uh, when uh, we talk about regulations. Uh, the regulations on uh, any uh, kind of uh, digital applications, uh, digital new technology that is uh, you know being used in developing countries are uh, usually uh, in terms of regulatory it always been outdated. So uh, he, she was asking whether uh, you also have uh, to face the similar problem. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Kung. You have been very kind. You have been very kind. Okay, I think we have uh, three feedbacks. Uh, one is about how can public service, uh, public servant, be adaptive in digital. Governance. The second one is how about the, the concept of the whole government to solve the problem of coordination amongst the agencies to build the capacity of public sector and also to change the, uh, the mindset of people. And uh, I think uh, Professor Mark Evan is now conducting research on mistrust. So maybe Professor Evan could also explain about the mistrust and how to uh, solve this. Uh, in your explanations, the public class is always decreasing. So what is the source and how we can solve this uh, distress or mistrust? Uh, I think, okay, uh, we could uh, start 
uh, with Professor Evans to answer the questions, please. Okay, uh, wonderful questions. Uh, and very difficult questions to, to, to answer. Um, the first question, which is really about uh, the traditional view that um, public organizations tend to cut themselves off from exchange. Um, I think the, the, the key problem here is that um, most, most of the public services are still very hierarchical in design. Yeah. Most, most public services are still too hierarchical in their design. Right? Um, and thinkers such as Jeff Morgan um, argue that because of hierarchy, um, a large number of very talented expert people in bureaucracies um, are marginalized from creative decision-making. In other words, he, he argues that we don't use the brains of our organizations because of hierarchy. That we have um, a large number of um, public servants who aren't empowered to get on and do the job that they're, that they're asked to do. Um, so, and despite the fact that we have a lot of academics, um, such as myself, actually, I, I've written on um, new governance and public value management and argument that we're sort of seeing a shift away from hierarchy towards um, flatter structures of governance. But actually, the reality in, in Westminster-style democracy is that hierarchy is still the norm, right? Um, and therefore, it's not surprising that public servants are quite reluctant to think beyond their boundaries and to approach problem solving in a different way. And this actually links to the whole governance issue as well. Um, because most public organizations are still very siloed. Um, they tend to focus um, on what they do well. They tend to recruit people like them. Um, so, for example, in Australia, we see um, um, is a very, there's still a very um, clear division between the policy class that are dominated by orthodox um, economic thinkers, um, the program management class that are, are separated from the policy makers, and in Australia, we, we have a third class, which is those people who are the services. And the argument is that you don't get hold of government, you don't get learning if you silo policy, program management and service delivery because you don't learn from what's happening on the front line. Um, so in a, in a clumsy way, I'm, what I'm trying to say basically is that we now really seriously need to think about how our institutions are designed and we need to be moving much more seriously towards flatter um, structures, um, power with responsibility. So we should be, be empowering our public servants basically to get on with the job of government, right? But they should be clear performance accountability. Right? Um, the other thing I would say as well is that um, public organizations in Westminster-style democracies don't do collaboration very well. They're very poor at collaboration. Right? And, the, and there's a reason for that, and as we know, it's called the principal agent model. Right? In other words, in most circumstances, the role of government is to give money. Right? And through contract, um, they demand, basically, that um, they, they control the rules of the game. Well, that's not good for collaboration, is it? Um, so, so the argument is you get better collaboration, more whole of government approaches. If you sh share values, right, you develop a sense of common purpose, right, and there's a more inclusive approach, approach to decision making. Um, so, so, my, so I think the whole of government 
um, observation links in very, very closely to this is that we need public organizations that develop collaborative approaches to problem solving, that are multidisciplinary in their approach, right? They're not dominated by a particular discipline. Um, that we think in a more innovative sense about the sources of expertise and knowledge that we, that we need in decision making. And particularly, we need to use the energies and expertise of the community sector. Right? Um, and I think um, we, don't, we also need to be to move beyond reactive public policy making to problem seeking. Right, so we all know what the key problems are that are confronting our communities, right? But we don't develop the decision-making architecture and collaborations that enable us to make a real dent in those problems. So, look, um, I think the great thing about digital technology is that it should be collaborative problem solving more possible. Um, it should allow different levels of governance to engage more effectively with, with one another. But it requires a concept of mutual respect, right? And shared learning and shared values. And we're still a long way from achieving that. The, the, the final question, which was really about. Um, about barriers to innovation um, and, and the role of regulation. Absolutely, we have the same problem in Australia. Uh, um, and of course, we have kind of become very reliant on institutions of governance to do that thing for us in many ways. Um, but certainly, um, as a parent, one of my great worries is the way in which our children have access um, to uh, materials and information um, that is extremely problematic. Um, and we have very little control um, over what they access. It's become, being a parent now is just so different. I mean, I have two teenage children and I mean, obviously, we rely on, on um, ensuring that they have good values. But they, but they have, we have no ability to, to basically control what they can access through the internet. Uh, it's a really serious problem. Um, we do a lot of research in our institutes on gender equality and attitudes to gender equality. And what we are finding is that millennial men and their attitudes towards women are completely shaped by the disgusting materials that they can access to um, And for me, this is one of the, one of the major challenges that we have uh, in terms of education. Because at the same time, we know that the internet is such a great resource for education. But it's also a great resource, basically, for undermining um, strong community values, particularly around issues of social policy. Thank you, Professor Echo. Uh, well, I really agree on the uh, what uh, Dr. Evans uh, portrayed earlier um, on the importance and on the positive and negative side uh, effects of the digital era. But um, as to the adaptability of, uh, uh, of public servants in uh, the e-governance era, well, um, first I'd like to uh, focus on the role of three institutions. That is, first, the role of the academe, Second, the role of the industry and the role of the government. So basically, the government uh, lays down the framework or the mechanism, and then uh, the, the academe adhere to these uh, policies, so as the industry. So 
in the Philippines, for example, um, we um, face the news that out of 14, uh, 14 uh, Asia uh, Pacific economies, in the recent uh, survey on the ease of competitiveness or ease of doing business, the Philippines ranked 13th. So we are really um, uh, down the line. So what's the response of the government? The government uh, amended the anti red tape act, which is basically um, on frontline service delivery, and that is towards the digitization of frontline services. So the government enacted the ease of doing business. So under this law, the government, um, the local governments and national governments as well, are mandated uh, to comply with the provisions such as zero transaction, meaning to say there will be no face-to-face -face, uh, transactions anymore later on, but in the preliminary stage there is. Second, uh, the seamless connectivity that all local government units and national government uh, agencies offering frontline services must uh, implement or install uh, web portals for easy access of the delivery of services. Yes, we have the mechanisms, but the next question is, what about the capacities of our local officials or uh, national uh, government officials? So here, the role of the academe will enter. So they will provide um, capacity building executive programs on really enhancing the capacities of our leaders in order to implement um, e-governance. And that will result, of course, to adaptability of, uh, of the new technology. And the second question on uh, the whole government approach, um, we have this uh, framework on governance reform framework that um, we use in analyzing um, issues and challenges that in policy making and in order to attain our vision, we don't only uh, focus on the political administrative system. We don't only focus on the systems, procedures, not only on the streamlining of those using traditional ease like um, efficiency, effectiveness, and economy, but also we use other two E's, that is on ethics and uh, equity, and another one is, of course, accountability. Even we are towards e-governance or digital era, still we have to strengthen our accountability mechanisms. So those are the five E's in 1A that is about the institutions, processes, and procedures. The second is the important factor, um, another important factor is the changing of mindsets and behaviors and paradigms of the people to adapt to this new technology or new innovations. And the next is citizen engagement. In order for us to implement uh, these new technologies, we really have to engage our citizens. And thanks to democratic values such as good governance, collaboration, citizen participation, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, leadership matters. So it really depends on the leader. But who will provide the mechanisms? So it's not only about institutions, but it's all about leaders, about the citizens, and about communication. So communication, especially in the digital era, is very important. It's not only a one-way approach, but rather it is a virtual cycle, and it is a two-way communication, wherein there, uh, there is feedback mechanism. And digital, um, the digital era will really provide for that um, good conversation or good communication in the bureaucracy. And the last question is on regulations and the barriers. Yes, we are facing um, regulations and barriers in the implementation of all these uh, um, technologies of implementation of uh, 4.0 and the digital era. Uh, we have so many regulations. That's why somehow we are, uh, we have restraints in introducing innovations especially in the procurement of services, in the procurement of technology, we have to adhere to the rules of our commission on audit on how to use public money in the right way. So I think that's, uh, uh, that's uh, all about um, the adaptability, the whole of government, and uh, the barriers of, uh, of the implementation of uh, digital uh, technologies. Thank you. Alright, um, I got uh, two questions from the floor. 
uh, first from uh, my uh, colleague from uh, Assembly University. Uh, and uh, well, uh, basically also uh, another question on uh, the case. First, how digital divide can be prevented and how uh, the bad or negative impacts of uh, digital governments can be uh, also uh, solved. Uh, well, the way I see it, the, the main uh, answer for uh, that is that we need a stronger commitment on the part of the bureaucracy and we need uh, more uh, younger generation who will be having a more comprehensive understanding on uh, how should we serve the people. And a recent uh, literature in, on public uh, administration, I guess uh, there are a lot of uh, you know topics on public values, for example. Under democratic governance, uh, at the end, uh, it is the values that uh, bind uh, together the public that will uh, ultimately uh, decide uh, what should be done by the government. Jadi, mohon maaf, um, dalam literatur yang terkini, kalau kita bicara tentang perbedaan digital, digital divide, tentu yang kita perlukan adalah komitmen yang lebih kuat dari pemerintah. Dan pada masa demokrasi, sebenarnya kita bisa melihat, rakyat pun akan melihat, kalau anda kata pemerintah tidak memberikan sesuatu yang bermanfaat buat rakyat, maka pemerintah mungkin akan juga digulingkan dengan cara melalui pemilu, nah, sayangnya. Artinya apa? Public value dalam literatur terakhir itu akan uh, sangat uh, membantu Tentu saja dengan catatan bahwa semua orang sepakat mengenai public value Second uh, question was about the case Because uh, here is the question about Gojek Gojek is the red hailing you know, uh, transport system In which it is, uh, I would agree with that, that it is not a public transport system actually it should not be used by the government because uh, it still put uh, so many, uh, you know, um, motorcycles and also private cars, and many of them are not uh, professional drivers uh, who uh, are operating uh, on the roads. And yes, uh, that is one of the issues. Uh, but uh, the fact that people supporting Gojek instead of, you know, private uh, transport, meaning to drive yourself is one of the key also uh, part of the government. We have to live with it uh, for the time being. In the future, probably uh, we really need to think about uh, the importance of uh, adopting public transport rather than private transport. Because we have been, as also Ivan also observed, people can spend uh, two hours, uh, five hours, uh, only to go from our, uh, their residence to uh, the offices. That is uh, really nonsense. And uh, the problem in here in developing countries, uh, probably we have to refer to what has been adopted maybe in uh, Western Europe or in uh, Japan or in uh, South Korea, in which public transport is the, the only uh, solution for that kind of problem. We should have used more buses, the one that was presented by UI, uh, yellow buses, uh, probably in the future more you know, trains, more you know, public transport rather than private transport. Jadi ke depan uh, memang yang kita perlukan itu public transport, bukan private transport seperti Gojek. Gojek mungkin hanya solusi sementara ketika uh, orang malas uh, nyetir sendiri, tetapi ke depan yang kita perlukan adalah public transport. Emmanuel Macron, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, France, has already stated that in 2020 uh, there will be no, uh, no more combustion-based uh, vehicles, cars on the road that is allowable in France. That is something that uh, well, uh, will be a drastic change in France. Um, let's say if uh, later we will, maybe in the, uh, in the incoming years we will see driverless cars. Now uh, Google, uh, Tesla and even uh, I, Apple has already been you know, working on it. And the possibility is probably 
uh, changing, disrupting everything. You can imagine if uh, a policeman stop the car, but the car has no driver, uh, and the car can actually refuel uh, itself, not by the fuel, but by Tesla, you know, uh, electric uh, car. So all the system is will be disrupted. And this will be coming in probably in the next uh, three years or five years uh, to now. And does the government ready for that? Maybe not. Uh, and I'm sure in Indonesia, people have not really uh, even think about it. Something that in the future it will happen, for sure. Uh, something that we must also expect that kind of things. And many uh, leaders in the other developed world have already been prepared for that. Although, uh, you know, uh, many are not really, uh, you know, uh, eager on, you know, using more advanced technology. But uh, slowly but sure, we will have to adapt with that kind of environment in which the government has to be able to, uh, to you know, uh, adapt the policy based on the new technology, new uh, system of, uh, you know, uh, doing things uh, in many aspects of life. Thank you. Thank you, Pa. We give applause to the speakers first. Uh, dear participants and speakers, uh, I was informed that we have to stop these uh, sessions because uh, Lan is there waiting for us. Uh, and I would like to uh, uh, conclude some uh, uh, remarkable uh, statement from the speakers. Uh, Professor Mark Evans, uh, mentioned we have to move or shift our uh, mindset and also culture set but also maybe uh, the way we uh, interact with the citizens uh, by having more uh, sharing values to the citizens so creating common purpose with the citizens so uh, approach the uh, problem with multidisciplinary, but change from uh, problem uh, problem uh, to create problem seeking policy. And uh, Dr. Lizans uh, mentioned about the needs of ethics, equity, and accountability. So uh, changing the mindset and cultures engage uh, engage the citizens the role of leadership in innovation, but also uh, the communication with the uh, citizens is very important. Uh, and I think uh, to conclude all these um, uh, presentations, I would suggest we provide priorities to three important things. How creating public values in the dynamics global society in the digital, global governance, and knowledge-based uh, bureaucracy. How we enhance the capability and also the culture of public uh, servants, uh, but also how to enhance the legitimacy and support from the citizens to the government as well. I think this is all what we uh, learned from uh, the first sessions in this conference. Uh, I would say very, thank you very much for the all speakers to very nice and fruitful uh, presentation and discussions and to all the participants for uh, very fashionable uh, and also uh, very active uh, discussion uh, today. And with this, I would like to end this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As the moderator of this uh, plenary session, thank you very much, Prof. Mark Evans, Prof. Wahyudi, and Dr. Lizen for the presentation. Uh, next, I would like to have a uh, to give a certificate of appreciation to our dear speakers and our moderator, and I would like to invite to welcome to the stage Professor Haula Rostiana 
as the Vice Dean of Research and Education, Faculty of Administrative Science, Universitas Indonesia, to give the certificate. Once again, thank you very much, Prof. Eko Prasojo, Prof. Mark Evans, Prof. Wan Yudi, Kumuro Tomo, and Dr. Lisa Peranka, as well as Prof. Haula. Thank you very much. Room. And the next announcement, I would like to inform 
uh, regarding to the publication plan of your papers, the publication chair has prepared an individual consent to publish form that will be distributed during the parallel session. The form uh, with, uh, will give the information and the suggested publication plan for your paper. So this will be distributed in the parallel session. Uh, the next announcement is regarding our uh, conference application. We have the uh, application that can be downloaded on your Android devices. This is called the uh, ICASPGS, HSPGS, International Conference of Administrative Science Policy and Governance Studies. You can download this uh, in your phone on uh, your Android. Uh, I'm sorry because uh, for the Apple system, uh, we don't have that in the Apple Store yet, but soon, hopefully. Through this application, we can see the schedule for the entire uh, conference that is held in these two days, including the plenary session, the parallel session, and the venue map, and so on. So uh, we suggest that uh, if you like to download this, very much download this application, it will help you in uh, the, as a conference guide. And I would also like to announce that we would have a welcoming dinner later at 7 p.m. So please don't forget and come to the welcoming dinner. We would have a lot of performance, dancers and singers, of course. And there will also uh, be a performance from the dance of faculty of administrative science students. So this is something that we, we, are, we are very looking forward to. So, all in all, uh, I say that have a great lunch, have a great break, uh, and I'll see you in the parallel session. Have a nice break. Thank you very much.